So John is, is, is one of our own, and, uh, and a very, very sort of prom promising um, one of our own, I, hope, I think, uh, coming towards your, in your final module now. Yep. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I was very, very struck really with this project in particular. I keep looking for him and you'll talk about other, you're talking about other stuff as well. I'll introduce what it leads to at the end. Yeah, yeah brilliant. Yeah. And um, uh, he's found this wonderful, wonderful place with just the kind of name that you could only dream of doing a project in. Uh, and and uh, creating some incredibly evocative images, talking about sort of very, very powerful stories. <coughs> But uh, I suppose the thing that kind of most interests me is how you're using, um, how, how you use rather, um, the present space that you're in to, to really talk about uh, narratives that are, that are kind of back in the past um, and, and that using photography as that space to, to explore um, something that didn't happen there, you know, and, uh, and, and with, with great effect, I think. Um, so, anyway, over to you, John. Uh, well, thank you for that, Jesse. Um, uh, and, th and thank you also for bringing Virgil up, so I wasn't the first one to do it. Um, and thanks for Bank Street um, for hosting it and the OCA. Um, so, as Jesse said, this is um, uh, a personal work, uh, and it's about the relationship I have with my deceased father. Um, it's clearly then a project about memory um, since he's been dead for the best part of 20 years. Uh, it, it is, to a certain extent, set in the land, uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But as you know, many writers have discussed, Bergen, Bart, um, photography is a conversation with memory. And this, this work is also about how poor memory is, uh, how poor memory can serve to narrate one's past, and, and how the rememberer has conversations with their memory to construct new memories. Um, and this is something I found uh, really quite interesting. I wanted to start with um, that classic work uh, Bart's small book, Camera Lucida, uh, and, and in particular, probably the Winter Garden photograph, where uh, Bart constructs for us a memory. He sits there holding this photograph uh, of uh, a five-year-old girl. Uh, he assumes it's five-year-old. There's no note to say what date this picture was taken. Nobody knows who the photographer was. Um, but he's decided that she's five years old and she's standing next to her brother who's two years older on a bridge uh, and it has the essence uh, of his mother in it. And, and it's just uh, a, a real construction. But we can now all see that. So that memory that he's provided us, we can see that in our mind and it's a construction of, of his own device, devising. N no mention of a punctum at all in any of this. So I thought I would um, provide you with a memory of mine, which was provided to me by um, some of my siblings. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about it as uh, the fight. So apparently um, I started this fight with my father in the kitchen. Um, and it burst out the kitchen into the living room. Uh, and after a while, it tumbled into the hall where my sisters and my brother were standing up the stairs, which is a, a U-shaped stairs, like the Von Trapp family, um, and before it ended in the front room. Now, I couldn't remember this. It was, it was something that was provided for me. And as, as I was told it, I could envisage it. And the more I envisaged it, the more I believed in it, uh, despite all sorts of things which um, didn't ring true. It became a part of family folklore that this fight happened. And, but it sets the scene in respect to the relationship that I have or had with my father and, and how I remember that relationship, which um, are not really the same thing. These landscapes are set in a place called Purgatory. 
uh, as uh, Jesse said, it was a gift. Uh, two or three miles from where I live is um, an unsettled place called Purgatory. I've Googled Purgatory. There, there are a couple of other Purgatories on the planet, both in America, you'd be unsurprised to hear. And, and one of those is a ski slope in Colorado. I don't know what colour badge you need to wear to go down that slope, but uh, there we are. Um, the earliest reference to it in local history uh, is in the late 17th century, which um, suggests one of the stories that it was um, set up to take people away who had the plague from the village. Um, and at its peak uh, in the 18th century, there's probably nine dwellings. There's a record of nine dwellings. And there's one left, and if uh, the rest were the same, uh, it, it, you know, the equal space was given to uh, stock to, to people. So there's a link there with animal husbandry, Jesse. So I'll, I'll do that. Um, but at the end, uh, sorry, at the beginning of the uh, previous century, around the time of World War I, it became unsettled and nobody's lived there since. Uh, there's some thought about uh, the derivation of, of it uh, it's probably to do with how difficult it is to get to and from. Uh, the, the, the space is it's on a terrace, similar to its literary namesake. It sits above a, a floodplain, and, and it's a long way from most places. But most importantly for me, my father could never have known about this place. Uh, I was encouraged to leave home um, uh, well, soon after I was 20, uh, and this place is 50 or so miles away from, from that childhood home. I want to talk a little bit about um, Virgil, um, uh, in that he was uh, accompanied uh, via, with penitence uh, in Dante's Purgatory. And that, that work is a work about memory. It's about uh, how your sins are purged, through various trials and tribulations as you make your way to uh, the Garden of Eden, paradise. And so that landscape in Dante's purgatory gets vested with a stain of sin, which is what you are trying to, to relieve yourself uh, of as you go from uh, the entrance to purgatory to, to heaven. Um, and, and what's critical about that narrative is that it's a one-way ticket to paradise. Um, it's, um, it's a bit like um, a Northern Rail slow stopper, really. It, you know, it's about the destination and, and not the journey. Really. Somewhat better than Southern Rail that just cancels and just leaves you where you are. Uh, um, in purgatory, in both purgatories, there are rivers running through it. In, in the purgatory that I go to, um, set this work in, it's uh, the River Dawn, which is a very shallow river uh, and, and floods at, at every opportunity. In Dante's purgatory, there is the River Leith. And the last thing you do as you leave purgatory, in Dante's purgatory, is to drink from the River Leith, which uh, relieves you of all your memories, all of your sins, get expunged, so you can enter into the Garden of Eden unburdened with any sense of memory uh, uh, of sins against uh, your God. Not my God, but there we are. So it's, um, it's about forgetting as well, uh, and, and about able to being let, to let go of the past. It, very similar in many respects to, to Freud's memory screen. You, you don't allow uh, those memories to burden you any further, you're relieved of them. I'm, I'm reminded, um, some of you may remember this, uh, Arlo Guthrie's Allison's Restaurant, where he's up Whitehall Street, and uh, the, the policeman hands him a piece of paper which says, um, have you rehabilitated yourself? Allowing you to, to go off and do whatever it is you, you do. So you've, um, You've, you've gone through that place. But I wasn't trying to, um, to forget, rather I wanted to, to engage 
with, uh, with my father, really. Um, and before this work became a work about my father, um, I tried a number of different um, tactics to start this, to start any work. And, and um, I tried in two or three different places. Uh, so it's when I got to purgatory that, that, that it started to click, to formulate something. And, and it seemed to, to me to be important that it took me an hour or so to walk to purgatory um, each way. Uh, and it wasn't until I got to the place that I was able to build the works. And, and that seemed to be uh, important. And it, it also seemed to be important that it wasn't a sunny day. So in, in the cold, in the snow, in the ice, and the fog is, is where the work started. And, and, I, and I started to make lots and lots of images, hundreds and hundreds of images, and, and then started to edit it. And when I started to edit, that's when he came back into the story. Um, and, and I started to comprehend what the images were about um, when I started to look at, at the viewfinder. And, and so I started to use the viewfinder itself um, as a way to edit, um, not wanting to, to edit afterwards. Um, and as I was progressing, um, he became more and more evident, waiting for me to fail, becoming a burden uh, on myself. And so the work bec that became the psychological trigger to make more work, finding what Bart says may be the punctum in the viewfinder. Like many of us, um, I've been a photographer for a long time, probably 30 odd years. Um, and I suspect I've got a practiced eye. I can see things and look at form, composition, light, contrast, and all those things that, that make photographers tick. I, I can see that. But what I found, um, I, I found myself purposely misaligning, shifting lines, breaking rules. I never took a tripod once, not because it was difficult to take the tripod for an hour long walk, but I didn't want to call myself um, a landscape photographer because I didn't want that burden that I knew would be, uh, be another introduction from, from him. Um, so then I, I thought I, I might ask my mother, really, to, um, to help me. And I went to see, to see her. She's still very much alive um, and with her own sensibilities. Uh, and uh, I asked her if I could have anything of his. You know, it, what, what is there that I could use? I was thinking about photographs, old photographs, any objects that he might have had, clothing. I was willing to consider anything to bring him into the conversation to uh, start that discourse. Um, and I'm, I'm aware that, you know, I never ever had, I can't remember ever having a chat with my father. It was always um, sets of instructions. Uh, so uh, my mother went to a sideboard and opened a drawer and brought this small purse out, which is about two inches in diameter uh, with a, a zip lid and opened it. And there were some jewelry. So there was a necklace that I never knew he had the ring that he used as a wedding ring, another ring that he had on when he, he was, um, uh, when he died and was taken off before he went to the crematorium, the collar studs, uh, and uh, so I, she said, would you like these? I said, that's fine. Is, is there anything else? No, that's all that's left. Uh, and so I said, well, I'll take photographs of them and bring, she, no, you don't need to bother bringing them back. That's fine, thank you very much. So whatever was left, she was quite happy for me to, to take, and I found that quite interesting. Um, she's never requested to see this work. She knows this work is, is done. She's never questioned it or become involved in that narrative. Um, and at that stage, I, I left it. I didn't think about it anymore. But um, one of the things that she did say, uh, which I found surprising, um, and again, this is about memory, is that my father was a keen amateur photographer. And according to her, he had his most enjoyable times as um, an amateur photographer. So he used to spend hours and hours and hours in the bathroom developing film, printing uh, the work, 
so I immediately thought, well, that would be a great resource. I could go and look at that. Uh, but uh, given that he knew he was dying of brain tumour, um, apparently he took all the negatives and all the prints and burnt them, which was a bit of a shame, really. A bit of a loss of resource that I would have, um, uh, would have certainly enjoyed. Uh, the, w one of the net results of all of this is that I was able to start a number of conversations, uh, a three-way sort of conversation about, about him and me, and the lack of reference of fatherhood, uh, about my sons and me, um, and wh whether fathering or faltering fatherhood was a, was a generational thing, and about my sons and their sons, uh, and whether, uh, whether in fact I'd, I'd failed them because of that generational gap. Uh, but it, it's been good because I've been able to have those conversations. Going back to my mother, um, I was interested to, uh, to try and, after I'd made most of this work, um, which you can't really see because it's so bright, um, it is, uh, I wanted really from a selfish perspective to understand what that family relationship was like when I was young and, and, and struggling to, to find out about it. And so I, I decided to ask her about a past and over four separate two-hour sessions, I recorded her testimony in four segments of her 80-plus year life. So the first 20 years before she met my father, the next 20 years, which is when she, she met, married, and had eight children, 20 years after I left home, and then the 20 years that he's not been around. And I, I became aware of... of of constant recurring narratives. So she would tell uh, the same story. The first session that I had with her, she um, delivered all sorts of interesting stories, um, two murders, infanticide, um, lots and lots of incest, uh, and all sorts of different things which just came at me out of the blue. Um, and I was absolutely shocked. And so, um, but recurring, um, and more frequently as these recording sessions went on, were similar narratives, the same, sorry, the same narratives, but embellished, told in a different way. So I became interested in that idea of false memory uh, and how unreliable that memory is uh, as, uh, as a means of telling the truth. And so back to that fight. Um, at the time, I remember being told, uh, it, it felt curious to me because uh, my, um, my response to my father's violence was always passivity. I was just allow him to, to rent his violence and do what he would. Um, it was a risky strategy and sometimes didn't work, but most of the times it did. So I can't ever imagine fighting back. Could never imagine fighting back. And, um, but, there was this, in, in group family, you could ask the question and they would say, yes, yeah, cool, remember. But individually, if you took those same family members, nobody could remember it. So I'm now absolutely convinced it never happened. It just didn't happen. Nothing um, about the story rings true other than uh, they, they would have wanted me as the eldest child to have, to have done something. Um, so I want to... Um, uh, I've started to consider false memory as, a, as another way of uh, developing this work. Um, and I'm going to show um, a, a little video in just a second. The, um, the video is some testimony that I took from my mother. Um, I took it uh, to a number of different people, the same sets of words, uh, and ask them to uh, replay those words to me. Imagine what those words were, and then uh, replay, and I recorded those words, and, uh, and they go on top of the, um, the video. I think we've still got a few more images here coming through. So, um, unless, unless there's any... 
Unless there's any more questions, well, any questions, <laughs> I'll go to the video. Should I do that first? I think if we just allow it to go through a couple of slides, uh, Jesse. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. you, John, I really liked how you told me just earlier that the text now all comes from your own memory or your own experiences. And I really like that what you just said in terms of how the conversations have become so important to go alongside the images. So that's, uh -huh. it's, I think it's fascinating and almost kind of looking at the malleability of what is there and how, how that acquires different layers. When, when I um, wanted to, to include text, uh, I, I thought my f would, would go to uh, literature. Um, and I thought there would be um, a lot within literature, standard literature, that I could use. You know, Turgenev's Father and Son, for example. And, you know, uh, but I, what I found was that there was a, a distancing between me and the text and the narrative. And so it became difficult for me to um, make a consistent set. It, so I, in the end, I, I just went back to my memory. Now, given all I said about memory, it could all be wrong. It could all just be wrong. But it seems to me to describe um, what I was feeling at about that time and, and uh, without being too specific. I think what I find interesting with the false memory is because of course there was what you said, it's kind of this fight never happened, but actually everybody wished it had happened. So in that sense, it seems to me it's almost kind of the stuff that is being pushed down, of course it's as true as, as the stuff that actually happened. That yeah. is almost the opposite there, kind of there was a strong desire for it to happen and that desire was clearly true. I think so. I, yeah, I, I, I did get that drift when talking individually to, to my siblings, um, and, including my brother. I thought my brother would have wanted to distance it, him from it, but it was a, a very curious thing. So that's his, um, that's his wedding ring that he used. You're talking about your memories, but the photographs are about things of which there are no memories. So it's an unsettled place. Things have happened there, but there are no memories of them. There is no record of that. There's almost nothing. And um, uh, as I sort of thought about that, I thought about how really quite moving that, that description is an unsettled place. Because it works on those two levels, doesn't it? Yeah. It was a place where people lived. I'm, I'm yeah. glad you found that because that's, yeah. It, it, yeah. it was quite important to to have the unsettling part of it being uh, foregrounded. Yeah. Yeah. What was the other text that you said? You said that now it's only your text in, in, in the project. But what was the other text before when you before you edited down to, to the other text? Well, um, uh, I used text from uh, Boltansky. I used text from Turgenev. Um, uh, and some I can't remember uh, a a anymore. But they, you know, it was pointed out to me that it, it, it became fragmentary and, and it started to take people um, away from, from what was, this, because it wasn't my words. As soon as they became my words um, and uh, it, it, the editing was on, on the words was almost as difficult as the images themselves. The, the jewellery was probably the easiest 
uh, took the lo longest amount of time to get right, which you can't see on here because the, uh, it's bright, but in the, um, in the project, it, it, it was very important for me to represent them as historical artefacts. So, um, you know, as I think I said before, I went to the Ashmolean to, to talk to their archivist there about how you represent artefacts, historical artefacts. And it, it's the fullest range of times. Every piece of information is there. Whereas in the land, it's none of that's true. It's all as ambiguous as possible. And of course, the fog helps that enormously, but summer would cloak it in a verdant veil of, and you just wouldn't see any of it. But the, the text uh, was the most difficult to get right. Um, I find it very successful in the sense that you, you say it's your voice, but it also is mine. Because the text is so personal, it's very generic in the sense that we all could have said these things. And I feel it's very important for this project to actually give access for other people to access their own griefs and, and their own, and their own business with, you know, with the past. Yeah. So I feel you've done a really, really great job at, at editing this text to, to this. Thank you. Because it's, it's really moving then. Uh, the, the box is here, if anybody wants to look at it after. Should we show the video? Yeah. I know things have happened while I was there, but I don't remember them. I only remember the stories that were told to me. I know things have happened while I was there, but I don't remember them. I only remember the stories that were told to me. Over the years when it comes into my mind, which it does on a lot of occasions, I think of it, it comes flashing through my mind and I say to myself, yeah, I know what happened, I know what happened. Over the, over the years when it comes into my mind, which it does on a lot of occasions, I think of it, it comes flashing through my mind and I say to myself, yeah, I know what happened, I know what happened. I know things have happened while I was there, but I don't remember them. I only remember the stories that were told me. I know things have happened while I was there, but, but I don't remember them. I only remember the stories that were told to me. Over the years when it comes into my mind, which it does a lot on occasions, I think of it. It comes flashing through my mind and I say to myself, yeah, I know what happened. I know what happened. Over the years when it comes into my mind, which he does on a lot of occasions, I think of it. It comes flashing through my mind and I say to myself, yeah, I know what happened. I know what happened. I know things have happened while I was there, but I don't remember them. I only remember the stories that were told to me. And that last one was my mother. 